Hello, MS Translators. My name is Brett Drummond. I am one of the co-founders of MS Translate, and I'm here to talk to you today, really with the third part in our series of videos talking about Epstein-Barr virus and its role in multiple sclerosis. If you haven't yet caught the first two parts of the video, you can find the links to those videos in the description. Part one, talking about some of the recent results that have highlighted why we think Epstein-Barr virus may play a role in multiple sclerosis, with the key message out of that being that the studies have shown that EBV is necessary, but not sufficient for multiple sclerosis to develop. And then a second video discussing how we might target EBV for new treatments in multiple sclerosis both in terms of developing a vaccine, which may be able to prevent MS, and also how it can be targeted by different therapeutics to be able to treat people already living with multiple sclerosis. In this third video, I'm going to talk about some recent research that's come out of Stanford University in the United States of America and talk about how we think EBV may be involved in triggering multiple sclerosis. Now, if you do enjoy our videos, make sure that you give that like button a click and also the subscribe button a click so that you can stay up to date with all of the videos that we're doing talking about multiple sclerosis research. But without any further delay, let's talk about these recent results. So as I said, there have been a couple of really pivotal studies over the past couple of years that have shown us that EBV seems to be necessary for multiple sclerosis to develop. So what that means is that if you aren't infected with Epstein-Barr virus, you cannot get multiple sclerosis. However, we know that being infected by Epstein-Barr virus alone is not enough for multiple sclerosis to develop, and there are different genetic and environmental factors that may be playing a role in this. We're yet to put all of those pieces of the puzzle together, but this is a really exciting development. But the newest piece of information that we can add into this picture is, as I said, research that's come out of Stanford University. And it builds on a theory known as molecular mimicry. So what is molecular mimicry? Molecular mimicry is a theory that we've known about for a long time that may play a role in a variety of different diseases. Essentially, what it means is this. When you are infected with a virus or a bacteria or some other form of pathogen, your immune system reacts. And so what that means is that, in particular, T and B cells, specialized cells in your immune system that are very specific for whatever infection that you have become activated. So when you're healthy and you don't have this infection, these cells are just circulating, circulating around your body and aren't doing anything. They're not prone to do anything because they haven't yet been told that there's a reason for them to act. They're essentially like security guards that are just walking around a building that doesn't have anyone in it that they need to be concerned about. However, when that infection occurs, they get that signal telling them that there is now something for them to do. They need to become activated. They need to respond to that infection against that pathogen. And so this happens all of the time. This happens when we have common cold. This happens when we have the flu. More recently, this would happen when we have COVID. But so what generally happens is that the immune system gets told to react against a specific part of this pathogen. They become activated. They divide. We get lots and lots of these immune cells and they go and fight that infection. And then when that infection is cleared, those cells really die off. We do have a thing called memory cells that are part of this process, and that's really the basis of things that we know as vaccines. They trigger these memory cells to, to be present, but they hang around for when a second infection comes on, the same infection, so that the body is already ready to fight against that disease. And that's often why the second time we get infected with something, we don't even really get sick because the body's immune system is all ready to go. However, in molecular mimicry, what happens is that these cells that respond against a certain part of a virus or a certain part of a bacteria also recognize some part of our self-proteins. 
that is that for some reason, the structure of whatever virus or bacteria they're responding against looks exactly the same to these immune cells as a structure of one of the proteins that we have as part of our own normal body. And so what happens then is that we have these immune cells that are activated and going around to fight this pathogen, but they're fighting ourselves, our own bodies, thinking that they're fighting the virus. And so this is what can lead to an autoimmune disease. And so this has long been thought of being potentially possible in terms of the EBV story in multiple sclerosis. We've thought for a while that EBV may be, in, may be involved in MS, though it's only been recently that we've had study results that have really highlighted how important it is. And so the theory has always been there that perhaps if EBV is involved, it's got something to do with molecular mimicry, and in particular, molecular mimicry against the myelin sheath, because we know in multiple sclerosis that it is an autoimmune disease where these immune cells are attacking the proteins found within that myelin sheath, that fatty insulation layer that surrounds the nerves in the central nervous system. So what this research from Stanford has shown is essentially that they were able to isolate uh, immune cells that reacted against Epstein-Barr virus and a specific part of Epstein-Barr virus and show this in people living with multiple sclerosis. And then when they screened uh, these immune cells that they found in these people living with multiple sclerosis, they found that they also reacted against a protein called glial cam. Now, you don't need to know much about what glial cam is other than to know that it is part of the central nervous system. And so this is evidence that's starting to link together this story around Epstein-Barr virus in multiple sclerosis. So let's now just put these pieces together a little bit to see where this research has got us to at this stage. We've had a couple of big studies that have shown that all people living with multiple sclerosis had been previously infected with Epstein-Barr virus. They also showed that in these individuals, there was no damage in the central nervous system until after they had been infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Now, this is in the first video uh, that's linked in the description. What we've now been able to add to that picture is potentially that mechanism by why that occurs. So the theory is that a person gets infected with Epstein-Barr virus which causes the immune system to become activated to respond against that virus. The immune cells do respond against that virus, but at the same time, those same immune cells recognize a protein in the central nervous system called glial cam and start to attack that, thinking that they're actually just attacking the virus, because to them, these two things look identical. And so that's potentially how we start to get damage to the central nervous system that we see in multiple sclerosis and how Epstein-Barr virus may be involved in triggering that process. Now, there is still a lot that we need to know. There are many questions that we need to ask around why does this only happen in some individuals and not others? What are the genetic and environmental factors that are contributing to this process? And how does that then become widespread and lead to multiple sclerosis? But it's a really interesting finding, continuing to build upon this notion, and I'm sure we will hear more about this and the treatments that may be able to target this at Ectrams later this year. As always, if you do have any comments or any questions, please feel free to post them below the video, and I'll make sure that I respond as quickly as I can. Thanks, everyone.